So thanks so much for joining us um, in our second of five um, sessions of this water series. I'm your host, as Mr. Rourke used to say on Fantasy Island, Marco Cuchito Monarch. Um, and we really want to thank you, for first of all, for responding so enthusiastically to this series. And um, we'd like to thank the Urban Institute, which has been our partner in this endeavor um, from the beginning, Dr. Sandy Rosenblum in particular. Uh, Martha Landrum and Julia McMullen um, have also been incredibly helpful in getting this off the ground, my colleagues at the Greater New Orleans Foundation. Along with our advisory committee members, who consist of uh, Dana Brown, Grasshopper Mendoza, Steve Piku, David Wagoner, and Jeff Thomas, we have 32, no less than 32, regional partners who are all in your pamphlets, so I encourage you to look at those, who represent really the diversity of this region. They represent public, nonprofit, and private endeavors and enterprises. So we thank them for their cooperation in this, in this undertaking. One, a, a few words about practical matters, if I could. Please, if you could, wait until the microphone is passed to you. We're filming this series, by the way, and we'd like to get every word you say, um, you know, recorded and, and audible. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, that would be wonderful. And on the practical note as well, if you want to see yourselves again or see significant components of this um, afterwards, after the fact, please go to our website where you'll be able to see that tomorrow. It's www.gnof.org. All right. So a quick word about the purpose of the series. The series itself is really meant to introduce new concepts, progressive concepts in green stormwater management, green infrastructure, if you will. Um, and we've started to look at several cities in the United States that have actually been leading the effort. So tonight, we really focus on Philadelphia and Houston, um, where we see a lot of really progressive things happening in this, in this realm. So we are also being joined, oh, I'm sorry, um, by co-moderators. Let me actually introduce you, so because we've started a little bit late. I want to get going with this thing right away. We'll allow 20 minutes for questions and answers from the audience at the very end of the program. And now to introduce our speakers. Julie Slavitt is Executive Director of the Tucani Taconi Frankfurt Watershed Partnership. She's charged with community installation of green infrastructure and citizen education and outreach. She has over 30 years of experience in community affairs, program development, and team leadership, having served for six years as senior district staff member for Congresswoman Allison Schwartz. Julie is returning to New Orleans, where she celebrated her honeymoon 28 years ago. So please welcome her. Michael Talbot is joining us. I'll, just one second, Julie. Michael Talbot is director of the Harris County Flood Control, Control District in Houston. The district has jurisdiction over the primary stormwater facilities in the county, which consists of 1,500 channels, totaling nearly 2,500 miles in length, along with more than 60 regional stormwater detention basins and a two and a half mile square mile, I'm sorry, and a two and a half square mile wetlands mitigation bank. He is joined by his wife, who today is celebrating her birthday with us here in New Orleans. Isn't this fabulous? <laughs> Please welcome Mike. And this evening, I have the honor of being joined by two celebrity co-moderators who are from our city council, uh, Councilwoman Susan Guidry and Councilwoman Kristen Giselson Palmer. And we thank them both for coming there, coming to join us. And for purposes of practicality, again, when it comes to the question and answer time, um, we can move next to our two speakers and ask the questions there. We'll just share a mic if that's all right. Great. Okay, good. Let me tell you something about our co-moderator. Susan Guidry was elected to District A Council was elected District A Council member in March 2010. Guidry's professional career includes working as an attorney and community activist, as well as teaching English on the junior high and high school levels. She is the former president of Parkview Neighborhood Association and served as a member of the Bayou St. John Conservation Alliance Steering Committee, District 5 Neighborhood Recovery Steering Committee, and the District A Neighborhood President's Council. So we thank Mrs. Guidry for joining us tonight. And her colleague on the council, Kristen Gislison Palmer, was elected, elected District C Council member in February 2010. 
Prior to serving on the council, she was executive director of Rebuilding Together New Orleans, where she assisted numerous elderly, disabled, and low-income residents return to their homes post-Katrina. Her top priorities include promoting local and regional connectivity, accessibility, and diversity within the transportation sector, and improving the quality of life in District C through blight remediation, sustainable development, and supporting New Orleans' cultural economy. She has been selected to participate in prestigious fellowship programs, including the inaugural Smart Growth America Local Leaders Council, as an advisory board member, the Aspen Institute's Rodell Fellowship Program, and the New Orleans Regional Leadership Institute, NORALLY, and the National Network of New Deal Leaders. She received the National Trust for Historic Preservation Award in 2009 and was recognized with the City Business Women of the Year Award in 2007. Let's welcome her as well. All right, so just a couple of words about Philadelphia. Philadelphia, as you probably all know, you being the water wonks of our region, is one of the nation's leaders when it comes to providing incentives, especially financial incentives, for the development of uh, permeable surfaces and the like. They've done an incredible amount of work in developing, um, in really blight remediation, using water management as a community development tool, something that most people don't think of when they think of water management. Houston is another national leader in this realm. Um, they've done an, an incredible amount in conserving green space and in developing regulations and charges, as well as rebates and fee reductions. And they run a massive 1,400-acre mitigation bank, which is absolutely fascinating. So let's start with the example of Philadelphia and welcome Julie Slavitt. Hi. Um, again, my name is Julie Slavitt, and I'm the director of an organization with a really strong, st long name that I'm going to tell you a little bit about and try to explain. Um, as Marco said, I was here 28 years ago um, for my honeymoon, um, and really um, am very excited to be back because this is a really wonderful, um, a wonderful, special American city. So it's it's really nice to be here. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention quickly is I am from Boston. Usually I start talking and then the first question people ask me at the end is, are you from New England? So I'm just going to put that right out there first. Um, I've lived in Philadelphia for almost 18 years um, and with a quick stop in Dallas. Um, and I am a member of Red Sox Nation, so I need to let you know about that too. Um, what we want to do is talk a little bit about um, the organization that I run and how we work um, with the city of Philadelphia. So again, it's an organization with a really no long name, the Tukani Tacony Frankfurt Watershed Partnership. Um, and we're similar to you folks in that we have a lot of history and people get very connected to names. So um, we're a 30 square mile watershed, half in um, Philadelphia, half in Montgomery County. Um, and in Montgomery County, people consider the creek and the watershed to be the Tukany. Um, you know, it's a Native American name. And when it runs over into the city, it crosses the city line, it becomes the Tacony. Um, and you can't say Tacony, you have to say Tacony. Um, and then it links up with a creek um, that's known as the Frankfurt Creek. Um, and because of a lot of changes in putting streams into pipes um, and putting roads over them, most people have no idea sort of what this all looks like because in the, at least in the Philadelphia part of the watershed, it's all pretty much underground. Um, we should probably really be calling it the Frankfurt Creek and the Frankfurt Watershed. Um, but when the organization was established and there were a lot of conversations about this, um, the water department especially felt that they wanted upstream partners to identify with the watershed and they were afraid if they didn't include the Tukani Tacony part of it, that wouldn't happen. Um, so from now on, I'm just going to say TTF because um, I only have 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> We're the only nonprofit partnership in the Philadelphia region um, that's organized as a partnership, meaning that we're a nonprofit organization that's funded by our municipal partners. We're not a natural lands trust. We're not the friends of a watershed. 
Um, you know, as those of you that are water walks know, there's a whole bunch of organizations that have watershed in the title, and we're always and we're all really different and have different resources and different governance. So it's important to say that. Um, our mission is to improve the health of our watershed, and we do that through education, outreach, and projects. Um, we were created because the water department looked forward um, to 25 years when their Green City Clean Waters Plan was completed, which is right there, um, and were, they were very optimistic in feeling that the plan would be done and that stormwater runoff would continue to be polluting their creeks. Um, and, you know, they're doing Green City Clean Waters because the EPA told them they needed to do something about their runoff and combined sewage problems. Um, but what they knew was that if this was successful, which we hope it will be, that the upstream runoff pollution was still going to happen and that Philadelphia does not control what happens in its upstream communities. You know, they're run by different officials um, with different resources and different regulations. Um, and they wanted to make sure that going forward they were going to be able um, to make sure that good projects and regulations were going to happen in those upstream communities to get rid of the runoff problem. Okay. I know paper is really old-fashioned, but I need to keep doing that, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so here's, a, I want to talk a little bit about the challenges. This is a um, map that shows you what our watershed looks like. It doesn't include a lot of streets and, um, you know, a lot of detail, because for you guys that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, but what we have here is, um, if you look down um, that way from those lines, which basically separate communities. You can see that in Philadelphia, the creek system is virtually, it's gone. The creek system was covered up, all the creeks and tributaries were put into pipes um, so that we could build the city. Um, above the line, which is um, Cheltenham Avenue, um, above that line, you can see that there are still tributaries and creeks existing. Um, people draw, you know, there's roads over them, they go through people's backyards, um, but it's a very different kind of system um, if you live in the city and you live upstream. We serve five municipal governments in Montgomery County that are our partners, um, and one of the difficult disconnects for us is that Philadelphia's drinking water comes from the Delaware and Schuylkill rivers, so our creek goes in to the Delaware River. So what, you know, our creek is a source of water for Philadelphia, um, but for upstream, those folks get their water from a completely different source, a different watershed, a different water utility. Um, so in Philadelphia, we can talk about needing to deal with runoff and water conservation and all those kind of issues because people know where, because this is where their drinking water is coming from. From the upstream communities, we can't say to that. We can't say that to them. Um, we can't say that what happens up here ends up in your drinking water because it really doesn't. So that's a challenge in terms of um, language and communication, how we explain what our mission is to those folks because they have very different um, you know, they get their drinking water someplace different. Um, and for most Americans, they don't even, you know, we all know this, you turn on the tap and you don't care where it comes from. You just want to make sure that you can, that it's clean and you can drink it and when you flush the toilet that it works. Most people don't care about um, those sort of details. So that's a little bit about the challenges. I think I like that better. Um, the other challenges um, are just to talk a little bit about what Philadelphia, the differences between sort of a, a watershed that's split 50-50 between the city and Montgomery County. Um, Philadelphia is in some ways very much, in a lot of ways very much like New Orleans. Um, you know, 30% of Philadelphia residents are living in poverty. Um, we have a really low um, rate of high school graduation. I mean, it's a, it's a challenge um, and it's pretty serious. Um, so in Philadelphia, um, the, res the t talking about stormwater um, is a, di is a, a tough issue because people are really worried about um, where their next meal is going to come from, how they're going to make sure that their kid can graduate from high school, all the kind of things that we're dealing with in an urban environment that we, um, that we care about in addition to the environment. Um, people have different priorities. In addition, um, it's sort of the nature where the creek is in Philadelphia. On that previous map, we showed that most of the creek is covered over. Um, there's one portion of the creek that goes through a public park. Because what Philadelphia did a number, you know, 50 years ago, was they put their 
creeks as they were building their infrastructure into public parks. So that's a positive thing because um, it means that it's not going through people's backyards um, and that, that it's controlled by a public entity. Um, but in terms of Philadelphia, where that creek goes is very disconnected from the grid of the city, um, has very few sort of gateways, and people just don't they tend not to go into the park. Um, and it's got a lot of sort of urban degradation problems in addition to the sewage, the, you know, the combined sewage problem that happens. Um, and so the picture there is just to show you, you know, when we do cleanups into Coney Creek Park, we often find, you know, pieces of, of automobiles and, you know, it's an ur it has become somewhat of an urban dumping ground, which is a challenge. Um, so that's sort of the demographics and a little bit about the development. In terms of the other picture here, that's Abington. Um, that's on the grounds of the Abington School District, and that's where one of the headwaters of the creek are. Um, and what you can see there is we planted a riparian buffer there, and it looks very different from what the creek system looks like in the city. Um, it's a big suburban green um, school campus. So just, you know, sort of what people people's... Um, understanding of what the creek and the watershed look like is very different in these two in these two places. Um, just I want to show you the boundaries again a little bit just so you can see very different governments. Our watershed is the purple one. Um, all those lines are streets and different government entities. Um, and the one thing that's also sort of an, an interesting issue for us is the community that I just showed you, two of the headwaters of our creek are in that community, but that community, which is a community of about 50,000 people, also has two other watersheds in it. Um, so I just, you know, I always think about the Public Works Department. They are dealing with different regulations based on which watershed it is. Um, and even though we're the most degraded in terms of Philadelphia, they have to worry a lot more about the Wissahickon watershed because they have a TMDL for sediment in the Wissahickon watershed. So um, it's, you know, it's complicated for local officials um, to sort of get their arms around these kind of things and deal with them. What I want to do now is talk a little bit um, about sort of opportunities and tools now that we've talked about all the problems um, and really talk about uh, sort of opportunities, programs, um, partners that we work with, and the kind of resources that we've been able to pull together. Um, so some of the tools that we use, as I said, we do projects. Um, so in the city, we've done a series of rain gardens. Um, and they're designed to capture the first inch of, of rainwater. Um, and this is a rain garden um, on the left in a beautiful, a beautiful park in um, Philadelphia's Germantown section. Um, which is where one, in one of those places in Philadelphia where George Washington hung around a lot. Um, it's very historic. It's a beautiful urban park um, that has really needed some more attention. So we got some interest from the community in doing a stormwater feature. There was a friends group that was active in this park. Um, we managed to convince the water department to pay for this project. Um, and managed to do a community build of a rain garden. It's a pretty big rain garden. Um, and it, we've learned a lot from this, from this project. Um, we really use it as an organizing tool. And one of the things that we found is that it really inspired interest in the community in this park. Um, and I had a, an experience um, where, we, where we were on a radio program with some of the local people talking about um, building the rain garden, why we built the rain garden, and the gentleman who was in interviewing us said, well, you know, I don't, what's stormwater runoff? And I went to answer the question, and one of our community volunteers said, well, let me tell you what that is, and this is why we're doing this. And it was like one of those moments when you actually feel like life is good and people are listening. Um, and we had had, you know, the whole process of building this rain garden was a community process of something like eight meetings where we brought in the designer and we talked about the kind of plants that we were planting, and we gave the community an opportunity to decide whether they wanted it to be formal or informal. So there's a lot of um, buy-in, um, and people learned about what it meant, um, and people live near the, you know, they live in that community. So there's a couple of little old ladies who go by and check almost every day to make sure that the rain is going through, that it's working, um, and that the project is a, is a success. Um, it presented us with some issues, which I know is sort of one of the things that you'll continue to talk about in the series, is to figure out how to maintain these kind of, these kind of um, facilities. So 
you know, we've, we've learned that we do, in fact, need to make sure that we have an annual contract with uh, um, somebody who's going to come clean the gutters because um, the communities, you know, the, the resources aren't in the community to pay for that, but it's our project. So we need to make sure that that happens um, and that there's a plumber who can go and check the PVC pipes on a, you know, every couple of months because as if you, for us who are homeowners, you know that leaves get in these things. So there's sort of a maintenance thing, um, and we're learning as we go along, um, which is one of the other things that I just wanted to say a little bit in terms of Philadelphia. This is all very new, um, so it's, it's intense to go to other cities where they really hold you up as the example, um, when we haven't been doing this for that, for that long. So we're learning, you know, we're learning along with you. Um, the other project we did is an upstream buffer. Um, here's the, the school district um, maintenance employees who are really wanted to make sure that the signage, the interpretive sign was perfect. Um, I think it was actually a lot nicer than they expected. Um, and we planted a buffer there that filters rainwater that comes off. Um, it's a huge school district property, so there's huge roofs, concrete, parking lots, and a lot of athletic fields. Um, and for those of us in the know, you know, grass, grass is just like a parking lot in terms of absorbing and filtering stormwater. So this was a perfect site for us. Um, we had an in with um, the assistant school superintendent who's a board member of the National Audubon Society. So we knew that he cared about these kind of issues. The school district made us go through an incredible number of hoops to get this done. Um, and they were pretty pleased with how the project happened. So basically, we funded it. Students pl did most of the planting. We paid for a landscape architect. And we paid for this beautiful sign um, that's an interpretive sign, because this is now an outdoor classroom. And this is the part of the watershed where, where the creek goes through people's backyards. Um, and they sort of don't think about it, unless, until, um, except in the situation where they you know, throw their trash down the, the um, sort of, you know, area of their yard that goes down to the creek. Um, and this is a, the purpose, of, you know, the purpose of this project is not only to help with this, with stormwater runoff, but it's also to serve as an educational project. So um, what we do is we bring out people in this community to see that, in fact, the creek in their backyard is just like this creek, and that they can plant these plants, and they can um, have less turf grass, um, and they can do the same kind of things that, that we did in this project, on, just on sort of a little, a little way, on mi a mini way to do it. Um, we're thrilled because we really turned the school to, the school, this school district into advocates. They actually asked us if we wanted to do additional projects there. Um, we've got fu gotten funded to do another reach of the creek. Um, and they spend a lot of money watering their fields, because, you know, athletic fields have to be green. Um, and the reality is that underneath their fields is a creek. Um, so, you know, as we're working on this project, the director of school facilities said, do you, know, do you know any engineers or any projects out there where we could really capture the rainwater and use that to water the fields? And that's what we're looking for, um, is for them to see that this is a benefit, a cost benefit for them, so that they're not buying water um, to irrigate their fields. So they're now champions, um, and we made sure that they continued to be champions because we gave them an award at our annual award ceremony. So I didn't include any of that in my PowerPoint, but that's always a really good thing. Awards are a really good thing to do. Um, how am I doing on time? Oh, good, okay. Um, some other tools to look at are um, Philadelphia has a huge tree planting initiative going on. I don't know if that's something that folks are looking at here. Um, and trees are not the only solution um, to solving stormwater problems, but trees are great for stormwater management. Um, so Philadelphia has a very active horticultural society that's planting a million trees in the region. Um, it's called Plant One Million. Um, and the city has also made a commitment to increase tree canopy. So we were able to get one position funded for a year um, to have a tree campaign organizer. Um, and what we did with her was um, she used volunteers to survey areas where the city wanted to plant trees. 
it was really perfect for us because what the city was going to do was use a contractor to plant the trees. So we didn't actually have to plant the trees because planting trees is a lot of work. Um, so we had students that came in and surveyed areas. It's sort of like canvassing for a political campaign. They provided, they got all that data over a series of about six months. We gave it to the city, the Philadelphia Parks and Recreation Department. Um, and over the next few months, they will be planting 500 trees in this neighborhood. Um, and we all, we plan on taking credit for that and we are thrilled because um, 500 trees is a lot of trees. Um, it's a real noticeable difference. Um, in addition, the Horticultural Society has a program called Tree Tenders where they teach regular people like us how to plant trees and how to care for trees. Um, and we have supported groups in our watershed because um, we'd love for, for people to be able to do that. We also feel like those are, um, those are people who are already interested in the environment and in improving their block and their neighborhood. Um, so we sort of consider them um, a group that's really easy to educate and to reach because they, you know, they already care about these issues. Um, let me see. Muscle serving. So assuming you guys have muscles here, right? Do we have muscles? No? Oysters? You have oysters. oysters. So um, we work with an organization called the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary. Um, and I know that there's a similar organization here that's probably a Lake Pontchartrain train organization. Um, and they do mussel surveying because what mussels are great and oysters are, are probably just as similarly as good, although I'm not a scientist. Better. They're even better. Um, to filter. <laughs> to filter water. They clean the water. Um, and the last, apparently the last time there was a mussel survey done in the, in the creeks in our area was something like 100 years ago. Um, we have not yet found a mussel. Um, but that's just as important as finding a mussel because what the partnership plans to do is to seed mussels into the creek system. And we want to be there when they start to do that. Um, so not only is this great, it's a great project in terms of cleaning up and restoring the creek, it's also a great citizen project. Um, I'm, not the, I'm not the kind of person who really loves putting on waders and going into the creek, but most people do. Kids love it. I mean, it's a great citizen science project. So we are all about muscle serving. Once we got trained to do it, you know, you can do it in any creek, um, in any creek in our system, and you can upload the data, and the Partnership for Delaware Estuary is thrilled. The more, you know, they're data hounds, so the more data that they have about mussels, the happier they are, and the easier it is for them to get additional money from the federal government to seed mussels into the creek. So that's one of our favorite, favorite projects. Um, and these are, you know, nature and bird walks are really similar. This is a group of kids in Taconi Creek Park. Um, looking for birds, um, and bird people are really wonderful, wonderful people. They'll go anywhere um, to see a bird. So we really, we work with the Audubon Society um, on that. And this is, you know, as I said, it's a real urban, urban neighborhood. Um, and these kids' parents are thrilled because they see this as um, skill building, um, and they're looking for those of us who have children, you always want to find things that kids are, you know, something that they're interested in that can really pique their interest. Um, and these kids, we bought them, um, I think they were cameras from the dollar store, um, little cardboard cameras um, and little cardboard binoculars, and they were thrilled. Um, in addition, one of the real tools that we look at, and I know that this is a, um, an issue here too, is job training. Um, so we have... Um, we work with a program that the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society does called jo Roots for Reentry, which is a program to train former Philadelphia prison system inmates in landscape management um, so that they can get landscaping jobs. We've incorporated into that program green green infrastructure, watershed education. Um, we've been doing that for a couple of years. Um, and we got a grant with the Horticultural Society from the EPA, it was an urban waters grant, um, to, to really put together better training for these folks um, and to put together some modules which should be available um, probably in the next few months so that they would know, they would recognize stormwater management features. They would understand that there's plumbing, they would understand that um, what native plants are, things that you should pull out and things that you shouldn't pull out, if standing water is a problem, um, they would understand, you know, what rain barrels are, what rain gardens are. So that's a, a project that we're really excited about. Um, it will be um, a great 
set of skills for these folks to have, um, and we're also going to be implementing it in terms of community groups. So I showed you the Vernon Park Rain Garden. We will use a module with folks in that community to continue to educate those people about the feature that's there um, so that they understand how that works as community volunteers. Okay. Um, I'm going to go through this a little quickly. Recreation, we just did a 5K um, into Coney Creek Park. It was probably the first race that had ever been done there. Just to what another way to bring people in. Runners are a little like birders. They'll go anywhere to run. Um, we had a couple of women who would run in, Bo in the Boston Marathon, which was really um, very special. Um, so another thing that we look at, you know, people are interested in being healthy and, and getting out there and running. We've also started a program um, called Watershed Heroes. And these folks aren't quite as skinny as they look on that slide, but like it's about my third, um, my third PowerPoint, so I'm learning. Um, but we, what we have here, you know, young people who come out and volunteer to do cleanups because they mean, need community service credit, um, and we make sure that they understand what a watershed is, why they're doing the cleanup. Um, we recognize them. We reward them. Um, we're working on a system of giving them digital badges, and we want to make sure that they can explain to their friends, you know, why they're doing these cleanups and why if you throw a, a potato chip bag on the ground, it's going to end up in the creek. Um, so these are really ambassadors, ambassadors for us, um, our watershed heroes. Okay, a couple of other, I think I'm almost done with tools. Um, these are the last two things that I wanted to, um, to talk a little bit about. Um, and I'm going to talk about the Green City Clean Waters first. Um, as we said, the Water Department has this 25-year plan called Green City Clean Waters. And they are um, providing and incentivizing folks to do a whole lot of different kinds of stormwater management features. This is a, um, this is a downspout planter. Um, and they do programs where um, people come out and learn about this, and then the city will actually go and install a downspout planter on properties um, on, on different blocks if they can get enough people that are interested. Um, so for us, this is really something that we do outreach about. Whenever we go to a community meeting in our watershed, we bring along all the water departments, outreach information, all the information about programs, because, um, you know, people, the water department's a utility, and people don't love utilities, um, and we do a lot better outreach than the water department does. So in our watershed, whenever we go to a community meeting, we say, hey, you know, you can get a rain barrel. You go to a workshop, and the city will come and install a rain barrel on your property. You pull together enough folks on your block, and the city will, an organization will come out and put downspout planters on all the prop, you know, on all the houses on your block. Um, we also do that with commercial project, commercial funds that are available. Um, the city will offers grants um, called stormwater management incentive project grants with commercial property owners. Whenever we talk to anybody in the business community, we, we let them know about that as well. Because um, a lot of this stuff is just really sort of word of mouth. We're in um, you know, a media market that's really saturated. So it's hard to get messages um, through to people just like it is, you know, just like it is here. Um, the other piece, and I don't know if you folks do this here, is um, storm drain marking. It's one of my favorite. Yes, you do. Good. Everybody's shaking their heads. Um, this is one of my favorite things. Not so much because um, you leave the decal there and you hope that people see it, but that while you do it, you make it a really big deal because um, people walk by and they always want to know what you're doing. It's a great educational tool um, for kids because that connection is just not there. Um, we've all probably watched people painfully um, sweep trash into a storm drain. It's a terrible thing to watch, but it's because they have no, they don't know. They just want to, you know, get it, out of, get, off, get it off their property. And this is a really great educational tool. Um, for our communities upstream, they also get MS, you know, they can list this on their MS4 report. They get credit when they report to the state that, in fact, all their storm drains are marked. It's something that the state really looks at. Um, one of the communities in our watershed, um, which is where um, that I, where I have lived, is called Jenkintown. It's a borough of 5,000 people. Um, it has a school district of about 600 kids, and it's a square mile. It's a little like Mayberry. Um, and we managed to mark all the storm drains in Jenkintown. We decided we needed to 
you know, that marking all the storm drains in Philadelphia is going to be quite a challenge, but that in Jenkintown it was possible. Um, so when some volunteer groups came to us with kids and, a, you know, some companies and different groups, we said, this is what we're doing. If you want to work with us, we're marking Jenkintown. Um, and we managed to get all the community, you know, all of the streets in that community marked. And they were excited because they can put it on their report to the state. Okay, so those are my opportunities and tools. Um, so what, what we wanted to do, I wanted to do is just summarize a little bit. Um, we always talk about using words that people don't understand. Um, and I spoke to a group um, of sort of suburban kids, um, high school students, and said, what's stewardship? I have two minutes. Okay, I'm going to be really quick. What steward, do you know what stewardship is? Complete blank stares. So um, just we need to think about what we say, because some of this stuff doesn't make sense to people. It, they don't understand it. Um, but they do understand that um, they want their neighborhood to be safe. They want to they wanna, um, mitigate flooding as much as they can. They want to let their kids know that there are sort of interesting job opportunities out there. Um, our municipalities want to be in compliance in terms of regulation. So it's sort of targeting, um, targeting what you do to the needs of your audience. And we all have really different audiences. We all have um, really different organizations that we work with. All right, one more minute. Here's partners. I'm just going to go through that really quick. Um, and then what, what's next? And I think what's next is actually my colleague from the Houston, from the Houston, it's a very long name too, the Harris County Flood Control District is going to speak. Um, but I wanted to say a few things. Um, I love this slide because I feel like it really shows that we need to make sort of the land-water connection that people have missed because we've paved everything. Um, and that we need to work across boundaries. Um, but at the same time, we can't really sort of forget the reality of um, poverty, cost, politics. We need to figure out how to manage all, all of those things. Um, you know, we, we're a country, I don't want to get into too many politics here, but you know, we're a country that doesn't, that used to be really proud of the kind of stuff that we built. Um, and it's really our job to say to the folks in Washington, we want to continue to be proud and we want to make sure that our, um, you know, that our cities are functioning well and that they look beautiful and that, and that people are unemployed. So I promised I wouldn't get too political. Um, but what, one of the things that Sandy wanted me to make sure that I mentioned was I used to work for a member of Congress. Um, and a lot of this is really like a it's very much like a campaign and constituency building. It's sort of convincing people about what, the, what makes sense, what we have to do, and we have to do this anyway. I mean, we talk about whether it's going to work and how we're going to measure it, but we don't really have a lot of choice. Um, so it's sort of explaining that to people and then making sure that they say to their elected officials, like these ladies right here, this is what we want you to do. Um, and one of the reasons why Philadelphia is committed to this is because when Mayor Nutter ran, a group of, of organized environmental citizens said to him, we have a pledge here. You know, here's a pledge. We need you to sign this pledge. And we're going to keep up with how you do on this pledge. Um, so, you know, what I say to our, our smaller communities is you need to do the same thing that they did in the city. Um, just because you're a borough of 5,000 people or a township of 50,000 people doesn't mean you don't have to say to your, you, doesn't mean it's less important for you to say to your elected officials, um, why are you building that new school parking lot the way you used to build everything else? Um, so it's really, you know, it's really up to us to understand the message and to tell the folks that get to make, a, make decisions for us how we want them to do that. So I think I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I don't know how to turn my stuff off here. Thank you, Julie. You are fabulous, and I know we're going to have a lot of questions for you from the audience, which has grown remarkably since I last turned my head, so thanks for arriving. Um, and now, next to it, as we um, boot up his PowerPoint, is Mike Talbot, of course. We chose Houston, Texas, really, out of pressure from our advisory committee, because I didn't know of all the wonderful things they were doing. So thank you again, guys. Um, it, it's, it, Houston is not only another southern town that's rather close to us, but is also gets an awful lot of rain per annum, doesn't it? So, so let me just shut up now and let Mike talk. Thank you. Thanks, Mark.
Thank you. I really am thrilled to be here today. New Orleans is one of our favorite cities in the world, and uh, when they called, asked me to come do this a couple months ago, I was thinking, hmm, June 5th, that's my wife's birthday. Um, and so when I asked her, what do you want to do on your birthday, New Orleans is always on her list. And so after she said that, and said, by the way, in the afternoon, I need to go over on Canal Street for... <laughs> And so here we are. We came in Sunday, so we've been having a blast, and it's a, a lot of fun. Uh, one of the subtitles of this program today is Strategies That Work. And when we're talking about flood damage reduction, there's not a whole lot to the strategies. If you, if you really think about it, there's two things you can do with flood water, and that's you can move it or you can store it. There's not anything else you can really do with it. But how you do it makes a big difference. And there's a, a lot of ways uh, that we've looked at in order to work with nature. And it's always been a lot easier, but this is something new to us as well as we've uh, worked through this. Uh, our agency's been around for 75 years and uh, probably single-handedly destroyed more environment than in any other agency uh, in the region. And, um, but we've learned from that and we're doing a lot better now. The, uh, the things that, that we're doing, um, you know, one size doesn't fit all. I kind of get annoyed when people come to Houston to tell me how they do it somewhere else. Uh, but there are things that I learn from everybody, but they don't all apply, and they don't apply equally. And so if anybody comes in telling you this is the way you have to do it because this is how we do it somewhere else, uh, take what you can from that, learn from it, and adapt it to the things that you're doing. And it's not just the technical and engineering that you have to think about, it's what is your culture? What are the politics of your area? What is the governance of your area? How can these things be implemented? And uh, partnerships are a big part of that. Uh, we have a, a lot of political entities in Harris County. We've got a lot of uh, nonprofits, a lot of environmental organizations that all have to work together to make these things happen. And uh, just, you know, Find what fits for your community and work with that. We're going to go through a pretty whirlwind tour of, of what we're doing in Harris County. That's just kind of where we are in the world. And I'm showing that uh, half the state of Texas and parts of New Mexico drain to the coast within 50 miles of Houston. Um, I'm going to show you that doesn't have anything to do with our flooding. But uh, as opposed to New Orleans, where half the United States and parts of Canada drain to the coast within five minutes of a walk from here. Um, but this is really what affects our area, where Harris County is in the city of Houston. And uh, it's a very small drainage area. But uh, we do get a lot of rain like New Orleans. We do have the threat of tropical storms like New Orleans. And we have slow, sluggish systems. We're called the Bayou City. Uh, no competition there at all. For some reason, we're called that. We were formed on Buffalo Bayou is the, is the main part of that. But nature gave us about 800 miles of natural streams uh, in the county and a high natural flood potential. We've got clay soils. We don't get a lot of uh, infiltration into the ground. Uh, we do have uh, some slope to the ground, but the areas that we have, these are our watersheds. There's 22 independent watersheds. Each one has its own independent flooding problem. I don't have a single source uh, of flooding to deal with. And when we talk about uh, our devising the plans, it's plural, because I need a plan for each one of these watersheds. It's not just a single solution. So we have a lot of uh, opportunity to work with things. The channel system we have today, there's 2,500 miles of channel, up from the original 800 miles. And uh, not in, none of our systems are enclosed like that. Our natural systems are all open. Now, back in the 50s and 60s, uh, some of those were concrete lined. We don't do that much anymore, but it's still a tool in our toolbox. But only about 7% of all those channels have concrete somewhere in them, uh, under bridges or, or what have you. It's not that much, so we have a, a lot of potential for that. And that distance, 2,500 miles, is New York to Los Angeles and back, if you think I gotta mow this direction and then come back and mow the other side. So um, looking at the, the, um, the greater Houston metro area, just to talk about that briefly, just for comparison purposes, uh, of course, the city of Houston is included in that, and they've got uh, about 2 million people. The unincorporated parts of the city have about 2 million people. That's outside any incorporated areas uh, at all. There's 32 incorporated cities within Harris County. 
when you get into the undeveloped areas is where our growth is. We're not confined at all. We have urban sprawl. And as they're developing out into the prairies, uh, they form what are called utility districts, and that'll be about 300 acres that serve, they form the water, sewer, drainage, and transportation for that new development, and they charge themselves to pay off the bonds. And so there's about 400 of those. Each of those has its own elected board. And so we've got all these overlapping uh, jurisdictions in the area, and where we come in on this is Harris County Flood Control District covers the whole county. But... Um, well, I'll show you more about that. And this is a, about a thousand square miles. And just to overlay the, the greater New Orleans uh, metro area, it's about one fifth of that size of, of where our development is in terms of geographics. And uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about trying to corral the urban sprawl and trying to uh, densify inside the city. It's a very controversial issue to try to increase density. Uh, we have no zoning in the city of Houston at all. And uh, when a high rise wants to go in in your neighborhood, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. And so the, there's controversy about trying to stop the urban sprawl, but there's controversy in trying to densify the city's population as well. Um, I, I'll just go over this quickly, but we are a special purpose district. Harris County is just where we are. Flood control is what we try to do. We were formed in 37 in that early part of the last century, I think. Uh, they did think that uh, engineering and science could control nature. Uh, we know we can't now. I wish they'd named us something different. But um, <clears throat> it just promises too much. And, but we are a district. We're a special purpose district that, um, that uh, we do have taxing authority. We do have eminent domain powers um, to acquire property. And we have an elected board because we're a taxing authority. Uh, we have an elected board that's the same as our county commissioners. That's our form of county government. There's one judge and four county commissioners uh, that serve as our board of directors. And our mission in its simplest term is that we provide flood damage reduction projects that work. That's important. Um, with appropriate regard for community and natural values. And we've picked apart this uh, mission statement. We've had it for about 20 years. And um, I like the word appropriate. In government, it's always nice to have a word that has such a subjective uh, meaning to it. Is, <clears throat> But it, it is the appropriate part of what we do is trying to make sure that we were organized by the state of Texas to be a flood damage reduction engineering construction organization. We're not the EPA. Uh, we're not a, a local uh, environmental protection group that's trying to, to control things, but we are trying to reduce the risk of flooding, and we have a lot of strategies to do that. I'll talk a little bit about those. But uh, we have this appropriate regard for community and natural values. There's a balance there between the environment and four million people that live in the county. How do you address the flooding problems and do it with nature uh, as much as possible? <clears throat> and so the things we do is we devise the flood damage reduction plans, we implement them, and then we maintain the things that we build. And um, just quickly on devising the plans uh, is we do take into account the existing environment. We do our engineering on that. We look at uh, what our alternatives are. And then on the finished product, we're also looking at how can it have environmental features in addition to the flood control features. And then we coordinate with all those agencies and entities around the county. <clears throat> In implementing the plans, um, we do build things. We build a lot of things. Uh, there is a lot of uh, that, that needs to be done to try to catch up to our current criteria of this mythical 100-year flood that came about with the National Flood Insurance Program. It's a fairly recent uh, yardstick to measure risk by when you have those 2,500 miles of channels that were built mostly before that time. And uh, we build large stormwater detention basins, and we also have a voluntary home, bri home buyout program that we work with FEMA. And those are in cases where homes are hopelessly deep in the floodplain. There's uh, nothing else that is going to address their flooding issues. And uh, we have, over the last decade, have purchased more than 2,000 homes and helped people move to higher ground, and then that area stays at o as open space. And then maintaining the infrastructure, those 2,500 miles, and we have 130 uh, large stormwater detention basins. That's more than 35,000 acres of right-of-way. And the uh, cyclic maintenance we do with that, and also our vegetation management program that uh, includes the vegetation management is growing it and cutting it. We do 
both of those things. And of course, we have lots of floodplains. 25% of the county is still in the 1% floodplain. Uh, not all of that's developed, of course. And the types of flooding, that purple area on the southeast side there is coastal flooding. We do get hurricane surge that enters parts of the county. The rest of the, the green area is where most of our population is, and that's just flat land, local flooding. Um, we've got uh, ponding and sheet flow in the street systems that can get into houses, and that's where most of our issues are. We do have subsidence. This is the, the ground elevations. Those are 25-foot contours, so uh, we are above sea level. So sorry, to, but that's uh, <laughs> all of our facilities drained by gravity. We don't have a single pump. We don't have a gate. Uh, everything works by gravity, so uh, some of these comparisons aren't fair. But um, the subsidence, this is just in the last 30 years, and uh, this, there was a subsidence district formed. Uh, our subsidence is related to groundwater withdrawals, and the subsidence district regulates all the groundwaters. It covers three county area, uh, and they uh, have been able to arrest the subsidence relative to sea level. The coastal areas are, are under control. The subsidence moved farther inland as the growth moved that direction, and their conversion plan is still in place, and there's uh, surface water being supplied to all these areas. Uh, that looks like a bowl, but it's not when you look at the ground elevations. Uh, it's still, everything still flows downhill. When we're looking at the primary responsibilities, this is where we draw the line with the local communities uh, in terms of Streets and storm sewer drainage are managed by the county. That's not, we're Harris County Flood Control District. We're not the county. And, uh, or a municipality, they handle all the street drainage and that's normally designed for about a two year flood event. But they also look at the more extreme events trying to make sure that the water can get to one of these bayou systems. Uh, and our bayou drainage uh, is managed by the flood control district. And so that's where we split, but there's a lot of cooperation uh, between the entities as we try to implement things. And then just best management practices as we're talking about how we develop our projects, how we design them and how we build them. Uh, we have a tree rescue program. When we're going in to build something, we'll go through and try to move trees to the perimeter or to other public lands. Uh, we have to do our archeology, span it's state law, plus it's kind of fun. But the um, project construction, I mentioned we do a lot of construction, uh, millions of cubic yards. All of our detention basins have to be excavated. Uh, we, can't, we don't build dams to, to control our water. There's no topography. Uh, so we do move a lot of dirt. We do tear a lot of things up. And um, the bridge aesthetics is something fairly recent as we're talking about alternate uses for the bayou system is uh, you can build a pretty ugly bridge and it'll stand just fine, but uh, the interest is in trails along our bayous that'll go under the bridges. And so they, we wanted them to look good from below. Uh, we build projects when the channel needs it. The other entities build bridges when the road needs it. So it's, uh, w but we're involved in, in trying to help that. And of course, our turf establishment, we gotta get some grass growing on our systems for the erosion. Tree planting. Um, a big part of our program, and we use volunteer uh, work a lot on that. Wetlands planting, uh, I'll come back to trees in a minute. The wetlands planting, uh, we don't just plant wetlands for the heck of it. We're, uh, it's part of our flood control projects in many cases, and I'll show you an example in a minute. And when we're building those uh, water quality features in our flood control, uh, we decided we ought to monitor them just to see, since we built them, do they work? And uh, we do a, quite a bit of monitoring. And some floodplain preservation. We're trying to get out ahead of development in some of that urban sprawl area and purchase the floodplain to preserve its flooding uh, natural, uh, the, the resources of the area, but uh, also mainly to keep developers from trying to do something stupid with the land. The uh, best management practices also go over into our maintenance programs is managing that much land that uh, we've some 37,000 acres or so, and the vegetation management and the repairs to our systems. We've got crews that go out and assess uh, all of our channel systems looking for problems. We've got uh, these erosion repairs that affect water quality and conveyance. Uh, the silt that goes into the channels, we go and repair these, uh, interceptor and outfall pipes, desilting the channels, uh, even with the, uh, the MS4 permitting process, we're seeing less silt in the channels from the new construction activities, but it's still there and we have to remove that for conveyance purposes. Uh, and uh, wildflower planting 
is something that uh, we do on our systems as well. You see two of those pictures are on a concrete line channel. Um, somebody told me that was lipstick on a pig, but it's a, it's a very, <laughs> people love to go out and take pictures up the bank uh, with their kids in the wildflowers and not see the concrete. But the, the wildflower really uh, does serve our purposes. It's expensive to do, but it gives us a varied root structure so that it's better erosion control. And my favorite part of that is uh, we mow three times during the growing season. That first spring mowing, the channels get to looking a little ratty and people are calling, why aren't you out here mowing? If I tell them I'm waiting for the wildflowers to go to seed, they accept that answer. So <laughs> <laughs> we can save a mowing cycle as, as we go through there. Our tree planting program, we, have, uh, we plant about 25,000 trees a year. I can't plant them just anywhere. I've got to plant them where they're not blocking the conveyance of the channel. The channels uh, themselves, if you put trees in them, it cuts the capacity in half. And so we've got to be able to plant trees where it makes sense uh, on our systems. Uh, but we are looking at how we design some of our new systems that are designed to have trees in them. And so we've, got, we've built some examples of those. Selective clearing um, is a program where we're looking to try to establish the tree canopy to get the succession of, of growth to shade out some of the undesirable growth that's underneath it. And uh, we have selective clearing on a number of our more natural channels uh, in the county to try to keep up the conveyance. Uh, selective herbicide, uh, we used to use 300,000 gallons of herbicide a year uh, about 20 years ago. We use about 3,000 now. It's a very selective program, uh, licensed applicators all on my staff. I don't trust contractors to do that kind of work. Uh, mowing, we do mow a lot, 16,000 acres three times a year. And that uh, little guy in the middle there, those buyout lots, those 3,000 buyout lots that we have, I got to mow those too. Um, <laughs> So we, uh, we do enter into agreements with the uh, neighbors to take care of some of those lots. The trails are a big part of this program too. On all those channel systems, uh, we own the right of way. As the flood control district, the public owns it through us. And I only need it a couple times a year to flood. And the, next, the rest of the year, it should be available to the public. And uh, this is continuous right of way along most all of our channels. Uh, we're working with this next outfit, they loaned me some slides. This is called the uh, Houston Parks Board. This outfit um, is a nonprofit local government corporation that is to benefit the city of Houston, but they're working inside the extraterritorial jurisdiction of the city as well, and so they cover most of the county. And they have this program, it's, it's a very aggressive program called the Bayou Greenways Initiative. And uh, this program is, uh, slated to complete a continuous parks and trail systems along our bayous. It's for physical and mental health, environmental health, and economic health. And there again, just the, an overview, that's the aerial of the Houston area. And they looked at uh, the 10 primary channels. These are along our original channels, along those uh, original 800 miles. These are some of these that they're looking at trying to develop uh, these park systems along. And they had estimated that along those systems, within a mile and a half of all of those systems, is that there's almost two million people that are within one and a half miles of, of that uh, area. And in the city alone, 1.3 million were that close to those systems. And there's tributary channels that would lead people to these, these spines, these main systems. Uh, a subset of that program, that overall program, they're talking is uh, $450 million, and it's going to take a while to do. They're talking about trying to develop 400 miles of trails. And they came up with this initial uh, subset of that called Bayou Greenways 2020. And uh, this spun off of the city of Houston having a successful bond election to issue $100 million in bonds to go towards the trails. They required that the local entity, this, uh, the uh, Houston Parks Board, at least match that. They're coming up with 115 million, and this is just inside the city limits of Houston, but all those trails are gonna be on flood control district land. And uh, of course, they're looking at some acquisitions, some design, the construction, uh, all of this to take $215 million and complete it by 2020. It's gonna be a pretty staggering program to, uh, to get it done, but when it's complete, it's gonna be fabulous. And they looked at the, the value of this, and I was a little skeptical. They previewed this with me when they're looking at what's the economic value of doing this. <laughs> That's not me. Um, this 
physical and mental health, they're estimating 77.1 million, the environmental health, 22.5 million per year, and the economic health, another 17.5 million. So this $215 million investment, they're saying, will return 117.1 million per year in countywide benefits and 70.3 million a year in uh, benefits to the city of Houston. Now, um, you know, we, we went over these numbers with them forward and backwards. They were really nervous about overstating the numbers as people wouldn't believe them. And in fact, the numbers they came up with were four times this number. And they said, we can't put that out. You know, we've got, we've got to cut those numbers back to something, something. Uh, and those, the numbers were supportable. They vetted those uh, uh, through a number of areas, but they didn't want to seem like they were stacking the deck in, in those issues. So they're saying this is likely to be like no other investment in the greater Houston area that'll transform the region's image, provide equitable parks and recreation amenities, make the greater Houston area number one for off-street trails, provide new jobs, keep the citizens and the environment and economy healthy. Along the bottom of there is uh, all the partners in there. I mentioned the, the partnerships that are having to uh, get together to make these things happen. Talk about this Greens Bayou Wetlands Mitigation Bank. I told you I build a lot of things, so I break a lot of things as I go. And uh, sometimes it's, uh, I've got to work in the channel systems. I've got to work on land that has wetlands uh, potentially in it. And so what we did in order to balance that was create this Greens Bayou Wetlands Mitigation Bank. And it's outlined in green here. The yellow area in the upper right was the first cell that we built. The red area in the center was the second. We're going to be developing the rest of the site over the next two years. It's 1,470 acres. And, um, and I've got five minutes. And the uh, mitigation bank, just to tell you uh, what that is, is it's run like a bank. You have to put your credits into the bank before you are able to withdraw them. And so we build these credits into the system. The Corps of Engineers and the resource agencies monitor uh, the program. And when we have an unavoidable impact on a project, what we do is uh, apply for a permit to the Corps of Engineers, and their priority now is first avoid, minimize, and mitigate. But mitigation now is going towards uh, the banking system, is to have these credits built in advance of the projects, and so that when you have an unavoidable impact, you'd look at that. And it, it does expedite our program. These are just some shots of the bank. Um, that's that northeast corner in the top left. Um, the birds that are coming in, the mammals, some of our game cameras out there, what we're capturing. Uh, this is about five miles from Bush Intercontinental Airport. Uh, we're not going to be a good neighbor when that area starts developing more, but uh, especially with some of these other critters. You, you've seen all these around here. I saw them just down the street. Um, and we're also working on an umbrella mitigation bank. Uh, this is a new concept where we've got an agreement where we can develop other sites anywhere in the county within this agreement uh, on individual sites as we go. And uh, this is going to be uh, really expedite the program to get more things in place. Bray's Bayou Watershed, I'll just mention this is one of our mega projects on those 22 watersheds. Um, just to show you a little bit about this, we're doing channel work. This was one of those concrete line channels, but we've got four large regional detention basins replacing 30 bridges uh, as part of this plan. It's a $500 million program and uh, pretty watercolors that uh, trying to disguise some of that concrete lining through there. But we're doing all our work above the concrete lining. We couldn't take it out. It just carries too much water. We couldn't replace it. And one of the things we are doing is blending the channel banks into park systems. This area on the right is Herman Park. It's the crown jewel of parks. It's our central park, if you will. Uh, and we were able to work with their Parks Conservancy group in developing uh, a more accessible channel system through here. That bridge in the center is a, was an opportunity for a signature bridge. It's a pedestrian bridge that uh, private funds were raised because of the, uh, how excited they were about what was being delivered out here for the flood control work in the trails. Uh, they raised the money for the bridge. Uh, this is uh, one of those four basins on, this is totally excavated, it's about 200 acres, but we created wetlands in the bottom of this system, but they were for my own selfish reasons, uh, again, is as we were looking at the size of this land, we were trying to slope the bottom, and the more we sloped the bottom to make sure it drained, we were running out of storage when we got to the edges of the property. So we said, well, what if we made the bottom flat? Well, if you make it flat, you can't maintain it. It would become a nuisance. Said, so, well, what if that flat bottom was the surface of a lake, a lake with an ecosystem? And so we actually created a lake bottom 
to these systems that has a full functioning ecosystem with wetlands planted around the side so the fish eat the mosquitoes and the birds eat the fish and we've got the whole thing working here and there's a picture of it constructed. It was completed about four years ago and is uh, functioning very well on the, the water quality features. Uh, one last thing is on low impact development and green infrastructure. Uh, the city of Houston and Harris County both have design criteria for that, but it's more permissive than required. It, there isn't a requirement that anybody does this. But um, the permissive part of this, somebody in the last session mentioned about the design competition for low impact development. They were a judge. I was a judge at that same uh, program a few years ago. And there was a lot of interest in that, but we didn't have criteria. And so if a developer came in with low impact development, it'd be a variance and they'd have to go through a variance approval process. And so we worked with uh, the developers and the engineers to come up with criteria so they could shortcut the process of trying to get things approved. The city of Houston also has a drainage fee that was just implemented a few years ago. And uh, again, permissive, they're able, you can lower your impact fee that you, uh, the drainage fee that you pay based on implementing low impact developments, rain barrels, rain gardens, those things, uh, you can reduce your fee. And new development also is able to reduce, they have an impact fee in addition to the drainage fee. They can reduce that by using some of these techniques. Uh, that's just the cover of the two manuals. These are at our website. We also have several other uh, manuals, this wet bottom detention basin. We wanted to create the criteria for designing those systems. Uh, these are larger than any anywhere we found in the nation. We were finding some two and five acres, that's 100 acres on each side, and trying to design those to work. Um, our natural stable channel design is how do we take these stressed natural streams that are in an urban environment and try to repair them uh, to where they stand up, and our tree and shrub guide. Our tree and shrub guide. So that's uh, my program. I think we're on time here. And uh, again, as I said, um, just find what works for your community, what works from a technical standpoint, what works from your culture, what works from your political standpoint, and uh, use the best practices, learn to work with nature uh, as, as we've been doing, and it uh, works a lot better in the long run. Thanks. Thank you, Mike Talbot. And um, as we ask our celebrity co-moderators, our council members, to make their way over here so we can have more of a natural conversation with them. And they'll initially start to ask a couple of questions, and then we'll turn it over to you, our beloved members of the audience, um, so uh, to hit us with any question that we hope is relevant to tonight's conversation. Thank you very much. And again, one note, just wait for the microphone to peregrinate in your direction to you before you actually ask the question. Thank you. Questions? Oh, let's start, Julie. Oh, start I'm sorry. That's all right. Sorry. All right, so who's first? I'm just going to open with a real quick thank you. I wanted to thank the um, Urban... Institute, and I also want to thank the Greater New Orleans Foundation. I think these types of series are hugely important. I've participated in a couple other ones, not regarding water management, but it's just so refreshing to see more and more people are coming, and I think it's really important to have this dialogue um, as we really try to rethink our city. So I just wanted to say that, and, um, and I'm, I'm excited. I think we see a lot of similarities in some of the assets that they presented that we already have, but we don't really have that organized fashion. So I'm really hoping that this could be a catalyst in how we really look at um, how we plan our city, how we do our city, and how we can move forward. So Councilmember Guidry, did you want to? Uh, yes, of course. It, it, this is a very exciting. It's a conversation that really can't uh, start and develop soon enough for our city. Uh, we all know that it's been eight years now that we've been beginning to hear the story about stormwater management, about management of our water in, in for many different reasons, and yet because we are building so fast because of the uh, recovery period that we're in, it's like everything you get to, they say, sorry, the design is already done on this. We'll get to it with the next project or you know come back and see us another day and it's like no no we really need to stop and take the time to change the design and we need to stop and 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 just 
change our ways for good. And uh, this is something that is so frustrating that is happening uh, right now in New Orleans that we are dealing with. We are learning this. We are learning all of this. But we're not putting it into practice fast enough. And so we need everybody's assistance in, um, in you know, um, outcries on that with regard to uh, private development, public development, infrastructure work that's being done uh, in every way. We need people to s insist that, that we stop and take the time uh, to plan in a sustainable manner. So I would just like to ask a first question, uh, and that is, uh, and I, I believe that you, Julie, your nonprofit, part of what you're doing is getting people to buy in. Right, and, and you've got a population, 30% poverty rate, et cetera, et cetera. So what, uh, what do you find works? How do you get the, the individuals to buy into the idea of stormwater management? Um, thank you. I just have to say, tell you this right off the bat. Is that I, Council Member Guidry, I know her sister. Um, and she's a remarkable resemblance, so it's wonderful. I got to work with her sister, um, who was a, a township manager in Springfield Township in, in Pennsylvania. So, um, and she worked on some great historic preservation. So it was really nice to be here. Um, let me see, how do we get people to buy in? I think it's a mix of things. Um, for us in Philadelphia, as I said, what we try to do, you know, Philadelphia is, and I'm assuming New Orleans is a lot the way, people are very focused on their own block. Um, you know, what's in front of their home, um, what that community is. Um, so we really try to focus on the fact that these kind of improvements are going to mean that there's less trash on the street, that the street is greener and safer, um, that it means that there won't be as much water on the street um, for them particularly, you know, real local um, emphasis, because that's really how... Um, what people sort of relate to. I mean, the other piece is that, you know, the water department is, um, and I'm not an expert on sort of the different structures that they've put in, but there is a, a stick as well in terms of commercial developers and resident, and mostly commercial developers and commercial property owners in having to look at how much stormwater is coming off of their property. Um, so for those property owners, they need to figure out what they're going to do if they have a lot of impervious surface. Um, the incentive is there because they don't want to be looking down the road and, and paying significantly more in stormwater fees. Um, in terms of municipalities, um, you know, the stick is there as well, but as we were saying here, you know, it's, there's not always, um, regulations can be sort of general. Um, and local municipalities need to figure out how they're going to be implementing them. Um, but for us, what we say to our municipalities is we're going to help you make sure that the state is happy with the kind of work that you're doing. Um, and, you know, the, the one other thing is we also serve, Philadelphia is doing so much um, that municipalities in our area can learn from where they don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, they don't need to come up with these ideas because Philadelphia downstream is already creating um, I mean, they're really creating an economy that's going to support this. So um, upstream, we may get um, municipalities that say, well, I can't find somebody to do impervious, um, to do, you know, pervious surface. But Philadelphia, because it's so big, will be, bu will be building um, an economy and building a, a number of companies because the, their investment is going to be so big in that. So that was a very long answer to the question. I'll comment briefly on that, just uh, from the uh, standpoint. It, it takes a, a lot of effort. There's uh, a lot uh, continuously to keep people's mind on stormwater. The um, issue we have for flooding, of course, is it's only a utility you rely on occasionally. It's not something that's in your face every day, like education and transportation and law enforcement. And so fighting for the, the funds for that's a big part of it. Uh, one of the things that we do rely on our nonprofits and our, our local entities to uh, help spread the word. We've got the Storm Sewer Marking Program. It's a volunteer program to get uh, people out to understand that. There's a big public education campaign with billboards and advertisements that are as part of our uh, MS4 permit. Uh, EPA was uh, smart and captured the whole urban area in those first MS4s because they captured the county, 
the city of Houston, the, the Department of Transportation, the Flood Control District as co-permittees. They got us all the first round. And so we've been doing this uh, for quite a while and it covers the, the whole population of Harris County. But it's a, it's a constant, constant education process and uh, a lot of people uh, forget. Uh, we get a lot of people moving into the area that don't know about it. So we're starting over uh, quite often with the education program. I also just want to say for the public, um, we have Sewage and Water Board. I think I saw Marcia St. Martin is here. Can we just have a, the people from, thank you, Marcia, for coming, the director. And there are a few other people here from Sewage and Water Board. And I just think it's, if you all mind standing up for a minute, I think it's good for the public to see who's here. Thank you all very much. I think this also underscores the importance of this conversation. I think some of you may have paid attention. We've had a, a slight, um, we're going to have a slight rate increase over the next several years to deal with generational neglect of our, of our sewage and our water system and also of our drainage system. So that, that we have people at the table right now understanding, and I think our city is at a crux when we talk about having funding for projects at a time when we can implement really good policy. We've seen that in transportation, right? When we pass our complete streets legislation, it's coming at a time when we have over $180 million about to hit the streets just with FEMA dollars. So when we're redesigning these streets, we have a policy, it's not policy anymore, it's law, right? We're the only one in the state that has this law, right? And only a handful in the country. The same thing, if we look at that, we could apply to this. And now's a really important time to do it before we start looking at how we, we need to utilize and start improving our system. So I think it's very important. Another piece to this that I would love for people to start thinking about is that we're in the process of, of redefining our comprehensive zoning ordinance to reflect our master plan. Right? So now is another time in New Orleans to start trying to put language within our comprehensive zoning ordinances of what we want not just our city to look like, but how we want it to operate and how we want to deal with, with stormwater management. So I think, again, this city is at an amazing point in time where we can actually implement things in a very thoughtful way and have money attached to that um, and have, I think, the will of the people attached to that to actually get something done. I guess we should turn over to the public. Right. Ready for questions? Well, fantastic. I feel a little bit like Phil Donahue, and this is going back several decades now. Um, questions in the audience, please. Yes. Hi, Miriam Belvedere, and um, my question is for Mr. Talbot. I wanted to ask you, uh, as a co-permittee on the MS4, and then also with responsibility to deal with um, repetitive flood losses, I'm wondering how you coordinate the requirements for both the MS4 and the community rating system, if, how you deal with that overlap within your organization. Yeah, the, uh, it's interesting. There, there's 34 floodplain administrators in Harris County, and we're not one of them. Uh, but we do work with all of the, the local entities on their uh, community rating system. That's where you can do certain activities uh, and get credit and lower insurance rates uh, for your community. And the actions that we take, uh, FEMA recognizes those. We're a cooperating technical partner, and the things that we do, uh, they can take credit for that on each of those 34 floodplain administrators uh, in the, the MS4 one of the programs we have is dealing with the floatables. That's what our agency is charged with dealing with. And uh, we partnered with a nonprofit that runs a skimmer boat in the, the Houston Ship Channel and downtown area. We pay about 350000 a year to their operation. And they categorize and catalog all the materials they, they pick up. And it comes from the whole city, basically, coming into downtown. So there, uh, there are programs to try to capture that and make sure that the community rating system is, is uh, benefits from the work that we do. Uh, there's several things in the community rating system that we, we get credit for the other entities. Other questions? Yes. Can, can I piggyback on that for a second before we start? Okay, this is going to underscore another important issue that's very important right now with the Bigger Waters Act and the draft FEMA maps that are out right now that are dealing with our base flood elevations. So FEMA in, in terms of what our, dra our, our draft flood elevation maps have not taken water mitigation into consideration while drafting these maps. And this could have a huge negative impact 
on on our city and especially you know on our properties and on homeowners um, insurance policies. So it's one thing that we're fighting for in Washington and that Senator Landry is fighting for and that our public needs to be aware of that we have got to put mitigation issues into it. For example, in Algiers, they're not in, they're not looking at the the SELA projects that were done that drain the water out, nor are they looking at the hardening of all of our pumping stations, right? Um, as ways of, of mitigating our base flood elevation maps. And they're downgrading huge swaths of our city. So this is just something that everybody needs to be aware of. Hi, my name is Kirsten Melberg, and my question is for Mike Talbot. Can you um, expand on the types of dedicated funding sources you have for maintenance, for funding maintenance? Right, the, the dedicated funding we have is uh, ad valorem property tax. That's our, our primary source of fund funding. Uh, we do collect property tax from the entire county. And uh, a penny of tax brings in about $28.5 million in, in our community. And uh, our tax rate right now is set at about 2.8 cents. And the county has another 1.7. So we're just over 5 cents per $100 valuation. And that's uh, almost exclusively where our money comes from. Uh, we have partnerships for construction with the Corps of Engineers and FEMA. But for maintenance, it's uh, our operation and maintenance fund is, is primarily out of that 2.8 cents per hundred. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll get you next. Hi, Dana Brown. Uh, Mr. Talbot, I was wondering, how did you reduce uh, the rate of subsidence? So you mentioned that. Yeah, subsidence uh, in our area is uh, different uh, to a large degree than New Orleans. It's uh, strictly from groundwater pumping, a little bit of oil and gas in, in the beginning. But uh, it's been around for over 100 years. Some areas subsided more than 10 feet relative uh, at sea level. This is right along the coastal areas uh, from industry pumping and, and water pumping for consumption. And uh, starting 40 years ago, when the subsidence district was formed, they regulated the groundwater and had to convert to surface water. And uh, the conversion is supposed to be complete by 2030. And uh, all of the coastal areas are under control. They have been for about 30 of those 40 years. Uh, the coastal subsidence is, uh, is zero now. And the inland subsidence, they've got uh, water authorities in place to build the distribution systems to all those 400 utility districts that have their own pumps and, and wells right now. They've got to hook on to this other system or pay a disincentive fee. Uh, if you continue to pump groundwater, they're not going to cut your water off, but you're going to pay a, a lot higher rate for it uh, after the conversion is supposed to take place. Thanks. Hi, Linda Santi. Quick question for Mike Talbot. Um, so there was that slide about the uh, the bond issue and the qualifying the the benefits, monetizing the benefits of it, and there was seventy seven million for physical and mental health. One of the bullets under there was urban cohesion. How was that quantified, and what does it mean, and what portion of the seventy seven million was it? Uh, you're going to have to get that from folks that put that slide together. That's, that's not our program, but uh, we did review that, and they, they were concerned about uh, that, that type of reaction to the numbers, but uh, they do have some backup for all that number. They've got a great website. Do you have a sense of what that might be? Uh, I believe it. I just don't yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah. it, it was an exhaustive study, and it, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting, actually. You, you can get a copy of that at their website. It's uh, the uh, HoustonParksBoard.org. I know you're brimming with questions. Here we have. I have uh, two questions. One for the two speakers. Um, what process did you go through to identify which types of soft infrastructure you wanted to implement as a priority? And for the council members, what vehicles are, exist in Orleans Parish for incentives for that type of infrastructure in New Orleans? Are you looking at the, the soft infrastructure for like low impact development or? Right. That's uh, another issue about what works in our community. And that's where we got together with the uh, engineers and developers and looking at our soil types and the technical information about our rainfall and the types of things uh, that we think will work in the Harris County area. And, uh, you know, we were having people bringing in studies from Wisconsin and from Maryland, and we said, this, we don't have glacial till. We don't have, you know, we, we can't have a policy that says no increase in runoff from your property that's, that's reasonable. And so we went through and decided what would work. Uh, we built some demonstration projects on some of 
uh, our facilities. The city has built some storm sewer and roadside ditch type uh, uh, construction that utilizes some of the activities to try to demonstrate their effectiveness. But it's uh, it was largely uh, technical based as to what will work with our soil types, our annual rainfall, the, the types of, uh, of uh, capture that you want to do. Uh, rain barrels is one of them. I'm not a big fan of rain barrels for flood control. As for you to want them as a property owner, you want them full. And for me to work as flood control, I want them empty. So it, it just, it's not, it's, uh, it, there's always going to be a conflict. Other questions? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Julie. We can share. See, see how cooperative we are? Um, so I think the city of New Orleans, the council has a lot because we deal with land use. Land use is, is the purview of the council. And we have a lot of flexibility in provisos that you put on to developers. I think many of the council members do it in a very ad hoc fashion. We try to force people to, um, force developers to plant more trees, to put interior walkways and parking lots. Um, those kinds of things that we're trying, but again, we don't have any guidelines to do it, and usually it has to be done within a proviso if they're coming to us because they, they want something um, within that project legally, right, through there. So that's one thing that we try, but, but there's a caveat here, right, and the caveat is we're, we still have so much development that needs to occur, and we still have so many neighborhoods and communities that don't have ec economic development, right, and so you, you walk a fine line to trying to really ask a developer to do something but not disincentivizing them to, to put a grocery store in this particular location or to put a development there, right? And to push them out to another neighborhood that then they might find more desirable or another district because they're not gonna care. So I'm, I'm constantly walking that line, which is why I think it's, and I push as hard as I can, but again, it, it's a give and take. You know, I met somebody from New York and we we're having a conversation about, about ordinances and what have you. She goes, oh, well, we just tell people what to do. They have to. Because they, they, they don't have this availability of land that we have, and they don't have, you know, they've got economic development, they've got what they need. And so that, that's, a, that's the caveat, which is why, again, I think I made those comments early on that if we had a comprehensive zoning ordinance that was very clear on what we have to do, it would really give the entire council, I think, a better tool um, and for us to, to follow. And just to add to that and, and to reiterate a bit what I was saying earlier, it, it's rather painful right now if you don't have um, the stick, you know, uh, to ask these developers to um, make these changes. Unless you're holding a conditional use or a zoning change or something over their heads, uh, then it's very difficult for them. They will say, uh, we just can't afford it. The financing won't work if we have to do X, if we have to add this. Um, and also, you need the administration behind you uh, saying, yes, big developer, there's no law right now. The, uh, the comprehensive zoning ordinance ho hopefully is going to be insisting on all of this, and we can use that and rely on that to, to make the developers uh, make these kinds of changes in sustainable infrastructure and uh, stormwater management and the like. But right now, we don't have those laws to require them to. So it, it is a carrot and stick thing that we're dealing with and that's why we really need the uh, other departments, the administration, everyone to be pushing as hard as possible until we get this CZO in effect and we'll have the laws to rely on. But which is why one of the slides, I don't know which, I'm sorry, which, which speaker it was, was Michael or Julie's, um, where they showed you did demonstration projects. and. If you could talk a little bit about that, because I think that's really an, a neat way of doing it, is going about it and, and do like maybe a couple sample projects. Like this is what it could be, this is what it could look like, and these are the residual benefits. This question's for Julie. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit. You mentioned early on that uh, your partnership is funded by uh, your, your governmental partners. Could you talk about that a bit more? Our, our partnership is mostly funded by the Philadelphia Water Department um, because they, they really have the resources um, as a utility to put those dollars in. Their, um, and the, the other communities fund it to a, a smaller degree. Um, so probably 80% of our funding is from the Philadelphia Water Department. Um, they really want to see us move to be a more diversified 
um, stable nonprofit, and so do I. Um, so we're looking at making sure that we bring in, you know, funding from into that we become sort of like other nonprofits in ter in terms of having funding from corporate sources, from individual sources, um, foundations. Um, you know, want to see us diversify our funding as well. Um, one of the things I didn't mention is that the William Penn Foundation, which is um, sort of the major foundation in Philadelphia, is really looking at supporting watershed work. Um, so we're in a good place because there's been a lot of attention um, brought to that. But right now, most of our funding is Philadelphia Water Department funding. And the other communities are very, because they're so diverse, you know, a community like that I said, like I live in Jenkintown Borough, contributes a very small amount. They just don't have the resources. Cheltenham Township is our other major source of funding. Um, and because they're not, um, they're part of the Philadelphia sewage system, but they're not in, com they're having some compliance issues. The Philadelphia Water Department said to Cheltenham, you need to give TTF more funding over the next few years. Um, I mean, that's, that's the reality. You know, they nudged them a little bit um, and said, we want to support this organization. They're really doing important work in Philadelphia and your community. And because you're out of compliance with your sewage, um, you need to give them a little bit, you know, some additional dollars. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, Dana. Sorry, I can't help myself. I appreciate the part about development because I'm, I really am very pro-development. Um, but if anybody tells you, which is so great why you guys are here, and the, and the, um, the council's um, public works committee meeting the other day, um, last week, was great, is that um, if anybody tells you it costs more to do catch basins and pipes than it does to do green infrastructure, their mama should give them a whipping because they're lying to you. <laughs> It's, it's not true, so. Thank you. So um, exercising moderator's prerogative, I'm going to ask a final question, if you don't mind. Did, did you have something you wanted to say, Julie? I'm sorry. Okay, you're okay, all right. You're the moderator. Uh, well, uh, I'm just, yeah, of course, please. Okay. I'm sorry, I know, but just the last, the, the last question, not Dana's comment, but the one before about um, how it's funded, your nonprofit TTF. I think it's really interesting to note that the council already has regulatory powers. We see it with um, how we regulate energy. One of the things that the council created, especially, at, uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a plug, Councilman McGidry, was energy smart, right? And working with nonprofits to make sure that we have these energy efficient measures. I, I believe very strongly that a precedent has been set. And I think, especially with when we talk about the increasing revenues that are going to be coming in right now and having and to hold sewage and water board accountable for the reforms, this could very well be part of that. And it would make a lot of sense to me to incorporate that within, within the, this. It, I guess it's an opportunity that we have that we didn't have before. So final question then. Um, one thing I find really fascinating about Houston is the fact that it managed to get the business community behind it. And in the South, as we all know, the business community is really incredibly influential in getting things done. To, to pass the, the 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 kind of the, the kind of tax that that Houstonians did uh, to, for the for the Bayou Greenways project, how was that done, Mike? I mean, could you give us a little bit of an outline of how you went about doing that? Yeah, the the Bayou Greenways uh, program. There was a, a big public campaign with that. The uh, the Parks Board ran that thing. The the final vote it was it passed sixty eight percent was the the value on the hundred million for that program and uh, the power of the Houston Parks Board in their fundraising is uh, they have nearly all the match already taken in, 115 million. There's a, a, a big part of the, the local foundations are really behind this as well in the private side funding for the program. But uh, it took uh, the mayor's leadership and the, the uh, public education on the program. And we've seen uh, the uh, Trust for Public Land uh, approaches us quite often to talk to us about uh, doing polling and you know nationwide that these types of activities uh, were, are uh, widely supported by the public and I think this is, they're using this as an example they were involved in, in some of this discussion as well and I'm trying to piggyback on that with the flood control angle is the, the county's parks master plan says 50 percent of the park space open space needs of the future are going to be met on flood control land i think that's light 
I think it's more of that's going to be built on our land. And so I need more money for flood control projects so that you can use them for parks. That's, that's okay. my speed alone. All right. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We really appreciate your participation. Let me remind you, though, before you get up from your seats, that we have three more of these, um, three more of the uh, convenings within the series coming up. The next one is June 19th on Green Alley Streets and Neighborhoods, where we'll be featuring the work of Milwaukee and Portland. So you don't want to miss that. Uh, and then the one on June 26th involves innovative financing options, such as some of the things we heard about in Philadelphia and Houston. Um, we're going to go more into, into depth with that using specifically Washington, D.C. as the focal city for that. So please come back. And then the, the, the final one, the final convening will actually really attempt to get some sort of traction behind um, having the city and various departments commit to next steps, really some concrete next steps. How can we work together? And not just the city, by the way, or, or you know, p entities that are involved with water management, but how can we as a collective, both as private property owners as foundations, as others uh, involved in this community, how can we get behind things and, and really set an agenda that's quite concrete? So please continue to join us and have a lovely evening. Thanks so much.